One thing that can severely impact our body's ability to move and breathe without compensation and thus pain is ankle sprains. Ankle sprains can be devastating because they don't only throw off the movement and the mechanics of the ankle. Because of the importance of the connection to the ground and how your brain senses the ground through this foot and ankle, when that gets thrown off, that's a threat. That is a threat to your brain and you will tighten up as a protective mechanism all the way up to the neck. And it's, a, uh, it's something that has to be dealt with when you've had uh, ankle sprains. It has to be dealt with in a complete total body perspective, not just through rehabbing the ankle. Because if you only try to rehab the ankle, you may not be completely successful in the long run. And I'm going to explain why. A couple years ago, I found a study about chronic ankle instability, which was defined as people that had... Uh, I think two or three serious ankle sprains in their life and their ability or the ability of their left left diaphragm to contract. And what they found was this, the chronic ankle instability group had a smaller degree of left hemidiaphragm contractility compared to the control group. What that meant was they were observing the left diaphragm upon inhalation move down and upon exhalation move up and they were measuring that movement and they found that people with chronic ankle instability had less of that contraction going that distance of contraction going than did people that had never had the chronic ankle instability so what were they observing well i know they were just observing really patterned people they were looking at probably PECs. They were people, they were looking at people who had probably a rib flare on that left side. They were extended through the spine. And when that happens, when you're extended through the spine, the pelvis moves forward on the left, maybe on both sides, PECs, and the back extends and the ribs move up. The diaphragm, both diaphragms, depend upon the position of the pelvis and the rib cage for it to maintain its mechanical ability to pump as a breathing muscle. When the pelvis comes forward on the left and the rib cage on the left flares up, the left side loses. It loses position of the pelvis and the rib cage and thus the left diaphragm loses its ability to work as a breathing muscle and it changes its function to more of a postural stabilizer. It's not uncommon for pain for, pe for pain, for people to feel pain through their mid around T8 area, mid spine on the left. Uh, that's a very common place and also the right, but very common on the left. That also happens to be the top of the diaphragm, the, the top of the dome of the diaphragm area. Uh, so it's, that's not really a coincidence because when the, when the back ex uh, extends and because the diaphragm attaches to the ribs right underneath, it alters the position that the dome of the diaphragm flattens. It's no longer domed. And now it can't actually move down and up because it's already down. It never gets to go up. The only way to get it, the diaphragm to go back into its dome position is to get the ribs down on the left. That's exhalation. That's the left ZOA. That's why we focus on this left side so much right here. That's le that left ZOA. That's what you have to get. Left hamstring, left adductor, left glute medius, left internal obliques exhalation, stability on that left side with the right side that can get you there, right glute, so that you can restore the ability of your left diaphragm to work as a breathing muscle. Otherwise, you can go right back into that, uh, that pattern. And again, the right side of your chest, this up here, the right apical chest wall, which the left diaphragm puts air up here, that will remain closed, shut, and now you got the, right, the tight right neck again, and you get pulled back to the right side. So it's just a cascading effect of, a uh, cascading sequence of events that if you can't keep that left diaphragm pumping, which is what they are observing in this study, you're gonna shift to the right, and you're gonna stay to the right. And uh, I believe they were talking about inversion ankle sprains. So what is an inversion ankle sprain? Here's the right foot, so I'm just gonna get rid of this. Uh, and you can look it up. The diaphragm contractility, diaphragm contractility and ankle instability. It was published in Medicine and Science in Sports and Exercise, 
the official journal of American College of Sports Medicine, diaphragm con contractility in individuals with chronic ankle instability. Okay. And I, I don't really feel like typing that in, so you can look it up yourself. Inversion. Inversion of the foot. Here's the, this is the right foot. Inversion of the foot is this. It's like a supinated foot, but I don't think... The difference between inversion and supination, uh, one is probably ankle. I don't even remember, but either way. Um, I think, actually, I think supination is a combination of inversion, abduction, and maybe internal rotation. I don't remember. But the point is, the foot goes like this, all right? It goes to the outside border of the foot. That's an inverted foot. That's what you find on the right side all the time. That's why you see feet that look more narrow on the right uh, and stiffer. And you ask people where they feel their weight and they'll say, oh, I feel it on the outside of my right foot. Very common. That's what you find in the left AIC pattern because when a pelvis comes forward on the left and back on the right and orients everything to the right, you're now on your right leg. So you'll feel your weight on the outside of that right foot or you'll feel it just in the, in the center of the right heel. I'd rather have people say that they feel it in the center of their right heel because I know they're kind of, they're not too far over. So if you think about different floors, okay, here's this paper towel, which I'm gonna get to a little bit later to show you how to make a lateral shoe wedge, which some people may need. So if you have a over here, underneath the outside of the right foot, I call that floor number four. On the inside of the right foot, I call that floor number three. When your brain is, when you feel your weight on the outside of your right foot, I call that floor number four. Your brain is oriented. It thinks that life begins and ends on the outside of your right foot. And that's extreme. That is a pattern that's going to be strong. And to stop you from falling over, falling down on the right, you're going to get a lot of tension on the right side, trying to pull you back to the left, trying to rotate you to the left. And it becomes a miserable state of affairs. You've got a right shoulder that comes forward, even though it's behind you, it comes forward. It, ha it causes a right scapula to completely disengage. You've got, now you end up with tight right pec minor, subclavius, SCM. Uh, that right shoulder is tight into you. Um, and of course you're over, you're over compressed through your entire right side. And you'll find that consistently with people who are, have their weight on the outside of that right foot. When people have ankle sprains, whether it's on the left side or the right side, you would expect if you had an ankle sprain on the right side that you then would shift to the left and stay on your left leg. But we know that's not true because of this pattern. The, the bigger right diaphragm and the smaller left diaphragm makes you stay on the right foot, but what you do is you just push your weight further to the outside of your right foot. If you put your weight on your left foot, which a lot of people swear they are, and maybe they are, but they're doing it in compensation. No one is doing it with true left stance musculature. They're all hip flexors and lower back. So they're not really on their left foot. A lot of times what you'll see is after people are, again, none of this is happening consciously. This is all unconscious. What you, what you will see is in order to not fall further over, they might hike up their right shoulder and, and have the right shoulder higher than the left. And now they look at a video and they say, no, that's not me because I must be a right AIC pattern. I must be this, I must be that. I'm not what you say, fine, because they see a right shoulder that's higher than the left, but they don't realize that underneath, it's because their pelvis has gone so far to the right that in order not to fall over, they gotta do this a little bit. And now they got upper right trap tension out the wazoo. Every time you try to use your right shoulder, you maybe you sit at work too much, you use a mouse too much, you sit on your right butt cheek too much, you're all right, 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 right. Your brain has no clue you have a left side and you're miserable. So you may also find a foot. This is always interesting because this confused me for a long time. You may find uh, someone whose right foot looks actually flat and they'll say, no, but I have a pronated foot on the right. Now it may look that way visually, but it's interesting. I was talking with a gentleman in Italy this week and he said, my foot looks flat my right foot looks flat. However, where did he feel his weight? On the outside of his right foot. So he wasn't really in a pronated state. 
his foot looked like it was pronated and a doc, he might, you know, go to a doctor or a physical therapist and they'd be like, oh, you have a pronated right foot. But he felt his weight on the outside of his right foot. That is fake pronation. That is not real pronation. And to be real pronation, you would have to have uh, this pronation guided by an active right glute. And I know that ain't happening if you're in a over on floor number four, no chance. Your femur, if this is the femur, I'm gonna skip the tibia, the femur is here, it's gonna be most likely internally rotated to try to keep you upright. So you'll probably have a uh, over tight right adductor, over tight right psoas muscle, TFL. I made a video about that. It's like, it's called, why is my right psoas hurt? Describing the situation. The right glute has dropped off completely. You're falling to the outside. You gotta stay upright. Everything starts to tip back to the left. Everything just gets this femur. Here we are like this. This femur has to turn internally to try to keep you upright. Now you got tight left at uh, right adductor, tight right quads, tight right everything, calves, everything, neck, abs, abdominal wall. The diaphragm itself is probably tight because you are so right-sided, you just cannot live and nothing's working. So, uh, at that point, you have that fake, you might have some fake pronation going on. How do you fix it? Well, right glute, right glute, right glute, right glute, coupled with establishing stability on that left side. You need, because remember, you're on that right side and you're not going to the left and you're just further and further out on that right side. So you lose stability on that left side, which we know is going to be unstable to begin with because you have less muscle over there and that smaller left diaphragm. So you still have to strengthen the left side. That goes without saying, You'll, I talk about that ad nauseum on this channel, so you can look that up. The issue becomes, how do you get off your right side so that you can go to the left? How do you get pronation of that right foot? How do you get that neck to calm down? Well, it's not that simple. Um, you know you need the right glute. That's why on my website, I have a right glute technique but you're eventually gonna to have to get upright. I cannot explain that. Uh, that's why you need professional help. And that's why I tell everybody, you're not gonna figure this out on your own, most likely. Uh, that's why I've done this for seven years and spent more than $20,000 on 25 seminars to educate myself on this so I know how to do it. But I can tell you this, if the, you're gonna need your right glute, you gotta be able to shift to the left, you gotta be able to stabilize that left side, you have to be able to reestablish proper right arm swing by using the serratus, the low trap, and the right tricep, and the right subscapularis. You need all those muscles to function properly, which means you need left abs to be able to secure you on your left side, so you can use your right arm and bring it away from the center of your body and get this thing moving around properly without going back to the right side because now your neck is back on. So you need all those things, but the point of the video was that some people, through all this, because they're in this everted position, because their femur was internally rotated, they may end up with a tibia that turns out. External rotation to try to make up for this internally rotated tibia up top. And sometimes that goes on for so long that you simply cannot overcome it. Maybe the ankle and the foot no longer act as normal ankles and feet, and you simply do not have the proper biomechanics to pull it off. And if you can't get that pronation on that right side, you can't get the right glute to kick in, you can't get the subscap, uh, you can't get the right serratus, the low trap, the subscapularis, and the right tricep to kick in, which means you can't turn off your right neck. The right neck stays on, it just pulls you back to the right side. Can't get to your left, can't stabilize on the left. Again, you're stuck. And you could work on these techniques perfectly. And I've, I've encountered this situation. People can do all the techniques properly. They can feel everything, they blow up. Yet, it still doesn't hold. And at that point, if they, can't, if they can't get neutral, then you know something's up. But if they get neutral, they can do all these techniques, they're passing all their tests. But then the next time, the next time they come back to see you, they're not neutral again. At that point, if this goes on for, you know, two or three weeks, three or four weeks, whatever it's gonna be, at that point, you may have to consider orthotics or before making the jump to accustomate orthotics. And again, not for support, but to guide this gentle person, gentleman or gentlewoman, into pronation through using the right glute. 
guide that foot into pronation because that foot may just biomechanically just can't do it anymore. So you may have to get some sort of orthotic, but you could also try, da da, here's the point, a lateral shoe wedge. A lateral shoe wedge would go in the back of the right shoe. So this is the right shoe, the right foot, lateral, so outside, shoe wedge in the back for the heel. Um, so again, it's right back here, right on the side, okay? And all you do, you can leave the insole in. If you don't have one, which I don't have any anymore, you can just fold up the old paper towel again and you make it to about an eighth of an inch. Doesn't have to be too high. Doesn't probably even have to be that long. And then you take that and you put it in the back of that right shoe, because I know people will ask where the exact placement has to be and how, how long the paper towel has to be and how thick and how wide. Right back there, this is the outside, not the inside. And you just put that there and put the insole back on top and then you slip your shoe in. Uh, your, you, I'm sorry, you slip your, your foot into the, into the sneaker and see how it feels. Now again, if this is all new to you, none of it may make sense, but if you are a seasoned PRI veteran or have worked with other PRI people before and are wondering about this, this may have some sense to you. So all it's trying to do is this. If you can't get on that arch for some reason, which means you cannot sense pronation, which means your brain can't sense pronation, which means it can't really turn your right glute on, and which means it can't shift you to the left. Hence, you keep repatterning and your tests keep going back to the, the positive test and not in a good way. Sometimes you gotta somehow get something that will keep you on that arch through the gait cycle properly so you can keep pronating and shifting to the left. And maybe after a certain amount of time, you won't need it anymore, but maybe you will. So when you put it in that shoe underneath, it just lifts up because remember you're like this, you're out to the side like this, this little shoe wedge will just lift you up a little bit and get you a little bit more inversion, no, sorry, eversion of that right foot. And that may be enough help biomechanically to get your brain to sense pronation of the right foot, which will then, with a right glute at the same time, because otherwise you're just collapsing if you don't have the right glute, and that's right adductor. Collapsing may look like pronation, but it's not. Uh, and that may be enough to get your brain to be able to sense pronation. Now you can shift to the left and then back to the right and back to the left and back to the right. And now you're walking without compensation. And I know there'll be people who say that you shouldn't do that and it's bad for your foot and it's bad for everything. I don't care. Uh, you got to do what you got to do. And sometimes the, the, the whole point of this orthotic <laughs> is uh, you might have to take it away at some point. It's to get the process started the foot might adjust, you might, uh, it might not, you never know. Not everybody is in the same boat, not everyone is in the same position. Some people have histories of ankle sprains, breaks, fractures, that this foot simply will never regain its ability to be an, a normal foot again. So you might need some help, and I know people are somewhat malicious about their foot and ankle politics, <laughs> but uh, you just gotta realize that not every single person, everybody has a bigger right diaphragm, but other than that, I can't say what someone's gonna need and what someone's not gonna need. And you gotta try different things. You gotta be open in life. You have to be open-minded in life. You have to be open to trying new things, experimenting and not worrying about perfection. Um, my body's never gonna be perfect. I'll give myself all the help I can get. Uh, and that's gonna be the case for a lot of people because you know, from, very, from purely scientific standpoint, if you reproduce, Mother Nature has done its job. You're worthless to Mother Nature. Uh, so the human body is perfectly designed to get us to reproduce, and now the human race can continue. Beyond that, you're on your own. So some people will need help with pronation of that right foot so they can get the right glute into their life, get the right neck to turn off, get the right, uh, get the right scapular muscles to turn on so they can actually shift to the left and stabilize on the left and then get their life back in order.